This is an 11 Alive Voices for Equality special, commemorating Juneteenth. Welcome to Voices for Equality. I'm Joe Ripley. It's our mission here at 11 Alive to help lift up those who are doing amazing things to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion all over Atlanta. In the next half hour, we're taking you inside the history of the Juneteenth holiday. Learn what it meant here in Georgia during the 1860s, plus the best ways we can celebrate and honor the new significance it's taking on today. While Juneteenth has been celebrated in Texas and other parts of the country for decades, it just became a federal holiday last year. Juneteenth officially marks when news that enslaved people on Galveston Island in Texas finally learned that they were free more than two years after President Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. First, let's take a closer look at how this holiday came to be. To learn more about it, we went to Clark Atlanta University professor Dr. Daniel Black, an historian and author who teaches African American studies. He helps us understand the life of freed men and women since the end of slavery. In 1862, rumor had gotten out that then President Abraham Lincoln was going to sign a document known as the Emancipation Proclamation. Black people certainly hoped he would. And so black people all over the South gathered December 31st, 1862, praying, crying, hoping, pleading in their spirits that the president would sign the Emancipation Proclamation the next day. Because if he did, technically they would be free. We now know of that as Watch Night. There are churches all over the South, all over America, quite frankly, who still do Watch Night. Now, some churches believe that they're actually celebrating New Year's Day, but the, but the root of it is not New Year's Day. The root of it is what they called Freedom's Eve when black folks got together and, and again prayed and hoped that the that their coming freedom would happen the next morning right and of course it did this is why many white churches do not have the tradition of watch night but black churches do because these were slaves who were praying that their 400 years of pleading and begging god for freedom would actually come and of course we know it happened News of freeing enslaved people took some time to get from Washington down to Georgia, but getting the word out was not easy. Slave owners fought to keep people from learning about their rights. Dr. Black now explains how enslaved people learned of their freedom and what happened next for freedmen and women right here in Georgia. Actually, in many instances, Union troops actually went all over the South making the announcement. There are even historical accounts that say some Union troops went and they were literally yelling to slaves, freedom has come. Freedom has come, your freedom has come. And many of the slaves were confused, like what is this? And who said this, right? Because remember, many people are not reading newspaper accounts. There's no, there's no way to Google it at the time, right? Uh, and some of them are taking this um, simply by word of mouth. But because it was told by soldiers, many of them said, is this true? Is this, is, is this possible, right? And so that's one of the ways that it was disseminated. Another way it was disseminated was by free blacks, which most people don't know. There were free blacks who could read who once they heard about and once they read about this freedom, they literally took it upon themselves to go and tell friends and neighbors and loved ones, right? You are free now, right? The emancipation has been signed. The war is over. You are no longer a slave. So there are lots of ways that the word got disseminated. And some of those, uh, some of those accounts are just heartbreaking because people were in the field literally picking cotton, like the moment they heard, or somebody was scrubbing the floor and threw the rag down and like, I'm done. What's also true is there are many, many, many slave owners who intentionally and forcefully blocked all communication coming to their plantation because they had a spring crop they needed harvested. And I want to at least get that harvested before I let these slaves go. Horrible, but it's true. I think the thing that's most remarkable, that, that most people almost never, ever, ever, ever mention, which is the most important aspect, I think, of the life immediately after emancipation is. It was not big parties first. It was not big festivals first. That's not what happened. The first thing that happened when black people got free is black people started looking for their family members. They walked all over the South on foot looking for aunts and uncles and cousins and sons and daughters who had been stolen away. There are tons and tons and tons of accounts of black people who literally gave their last piece of energy trying to see if they might get a glimpse of a son or a daughter again. There's a book called Help Me to Find My People, right? This book explains in very vivid detail 
how black folks, when they left the plantation, some of them walked hundreds and some thousands from Georgia to Alabama, from Alabama to Arkansas, from, and on foot, on foot trying to find children who had been stolen away. And this is really, really, really important because number one, it shows the price black people paid to put back together again what white folks had dismantled and what white folks had broken. Our most important institution, our families. And this is important for young people to know because what it will help young people to understand is that somebody paid a heavy price for their being, paid a heavy, heavy, heavy price for the maintenance of the unit called the black family, right? That's important. Another reason this is so unbelievably critically important is so that we understand too that emancipation was not simply a party. That's not what it was. It, that's not what it was. It was an invitation for us to restore our communities. It was an invitation for us to get, put our families back together again the way we wanted it to happen, right? And that's, and that's just too important, I think, to look over. I think that's just too important to look over. When you start thinking about the physical condition black people had to be in to even pull that off, you start really understanding, right? See, walking to Alabama from Georgia is a different thing than driving, right? And all of the counts I've read, people were on foot. But it also says something about the power of black love. The important thing that most people also don't know is this searching for family members turned into what black people start calling family reunions. The black family reunion now, which almost all of us have been to at some point somewhere, right, is the exact thing that black folks did once slavery ended. This is why the majority of black people have family reunions, but generally white folks don't. Because the family reunion, even now, what people are really doing, even now in 2022, People are hoping someone will show up to the family reunion who we don't know. Someone who's related to us. We're hoping that we'll discover blood even now that we, we've known existed, but we never knew what happened to it. And we hear stories all the time when we get to a family reunion and, and you know, some, some, some child meets an auntie who came from North Carolina. Oh my God, you, you're my grandmother's sister? Yes, and we have another brother. What? We have an uncle, where is he? Right? Because remember, people are not keeping records on black life. People are not archiving black movement. So black folks had to do the best we could. And the best we could was to gather every year and put the word out that this family was gathering. And if you know anybody who's, who's committed to and who's included in this bloodline, please send them. And those family reunions are absolutely central to our existence as a people and as a nation. A life after slavery. Coming up next in our Voices for Equality series, Dr. Black explains how the freedmen and women began rebuilding once their chains were broken. Welcome back to Voices for Equality as we take a closer look at the history and celebration of Juneteenth. As newly freed former slaves started building lives of their own, historically black colleges took on a huge role in helping not just with education, but forming a thriving society. Clark Atlanta University professor Dr. Daniel Black now helps us understand the power and importance of HBCUs. And ironically, it's historically black colleges that first celebrate emancipation. That's right because the, mo most of these schools were in existence in the 1870s. And just acknowledging that, that, that enslavement had ended and acknowledging the price black folks had paid to be free. Uh, black colleges, of course, knew about this history, black professors at black colleges, and there were many, many black schools that had such celebrations. Historically, black colleges and universities are really the dream and the hope of the slave. And we need black colleges and universities like Christians need heaven. Because really, black colleges and universities are saying black children and black children's education is not optional. It must happen. It's their inheritance. They are due this knowledge. They must have it. And I'm saying that because black colleges like Clark Atlanta University, most of them were founded, as I said earlier, in these emancipation years, in this time, if you will, of Juneteenth, right? And 
we have to understand that these schools are doing a level of education and these schools are teaching things that um, majority institutions never, ever, ever, ever teach. And without black schools, without black schools, black people, the black community and America in general would degenerate and would be far less in terms of quality and culture. You know, one of the things about Reconstruction that I think is completely phenomenal is that black folks during that time didn't spend a lot of energy trying to quote unquote get back at slave owners. It would seem justifiable, right? But that's not what happened. What black folks did was they got busy building institutions. See, if you talk about the years of Reconstruction, almost all black colleges are founded in the Reconstruction years, right? Black churches are built by hand all over this nation. The reason that's important is, and I teach my students this all the time, these black churches that were built by hand who knew carpentry like that? Who knew brick masonry like that? Who can lay floors like that? But it's happening not in one place. It's happening all over the South. So somewhere the artesian, somewhere the trading, somewhere the brilliance of black people had been totally missed nationwide. But if we think about it, these are the same people who built the plantation homes. These are the same people who built Emory. These are the same people who built, I'm gonna say it, yeah, I'm gonna say it. These are the same people who built Harvard. These are the same people who, who, who built Princeton. It's the same people, it's the same skill set. They just brought it home. But that's important because Reconstruction saw a flourishing of black communities that really scared America. It scared America so bad, we had black senators, we had black lawyers, we, had, we were sending black people to Congress in the 1870s and 1880s. That scared white folks so bad that that's when black codes and that's when the Ku Klux Klan became popular. This is extremely important to note. The Ku Klux Klan didn't even exist when slavery ended. The Ku Klux Klan and black codes were in reaction to black social progress once slavery ended. That's very important to understand. Like black people are, y'all are moving too fast. Oh my God, are you gonna take over this nation? Black kids are going to school by the hundreds of thousands in, in these black institutions, right? But white people have perpetuated the notion that black people couldn't read. Then how in the world did we go to colleges if we could not read? It doesn't even align up. Like the history doesn't even match, right? It, black social progress literally scared this country. Yet, what I do believe has been magnificent and wonderful is the fact that we as descendants of enslaved people, we as the descendants of those who on Juneteenth were crying and celebrating, the fact that we can now go to any school we want to, the fact that we can now read if we will, I think is an achievement the ancestors weep about. Because what it cost them, um, when they imagined what it might be like to be able to pick up a book and open it and actually comprehend what it says, that was tantamount to going to heaven, right? And the thing I think that's so important for us to remember is our ancestors were trying to suggest to us that heaven is in your head, not in some place above you. Yeah. The African-American dream, if you, if you will, was not a notion of wealth and materiality. The African-American dream was an issue of knowledge. Black people, ex-slaves believed one thing. If you could gain enough knowledge to create your own life on your own terms, to know God for yourself, if you could attain enough information through reading, through writing, such that you could not be enslaved again, that was heaven, that was freedom. It is considered one of the oldest jubilees in the South. Up next in our Voices for Equality series, we head to Thomaston, where many in the small Georgia community are trying to preserve their place in history. Thomaston, Georgia, a small town 65 miles south of Atlanta, population just under 9,000. 
But a big moment in history happened there. Emancipation Day back on May 29th, 1865. More now on one of the oldest celebrations of freedom here in Georgia and the slow moving wave of freedom across the South. On May 29th, 1865, 1865, that's when in a place called Thomaston, that's when slaves heard about it there. And consequently, the largest emancipation celebration happens actually right here in Georgia, in Thomaston, Georgia, in a place called Upson County. Thousands and thousands and thousands of black people gather absolutely every year in Thomaston and celebrate what they call Emancipation Day. The Civil War officially ended on April 9, 1865, but the Confederate Army did not surrender quietly or quickly. Here's Dr. Daniel Black, an historian and professor at Clark Atlanta University. So of course, the Emancipation Proclamation didn't, didn't free anyone really immediately, right? And we know most folks didn't even hear about it. June team in and uh, 29 May are twin brothers, twin brother and sister, and they run together. Author and historian James McGill has written extensively about the black experience in Upson County, where enslaved people, he says, learned nearly two months later they were finally free. They called all the uh, all the slaves to to the Cohas Square and told them that they were they was uh, they were not able to feed them, and so that's when they turned them loose. The slaves they didn't know how to act. They didn't know how to reach, respond because they were so used to of uh, their slave masters helping them. McGill says a man named William Gifford created an Emancipation Day celebration at the old train station in Thomaston in 1866. Each year since, it's grown to now include thousands from around the South, considered to be the oldest emancipation celebration in the region. Almost kind of as a counter celebration to the 4th of July, you know, like how dare you celebrate Freedom America if I was not free. It wasn't just partying and just eating. It was also memory and it was also remembering and it was also paying homage to, um, to those who had paid the price for this. McGill says the goal is to grow, to educate more people, especially younger generations, and keep their history alive. Old saying said, if it wasn't recorded, it didn't happen. You know, but now the Lord had blessed us with, with information and we should not let our uh, history die. It's not just another day off. Coming up next in our Voices for Equality series, Dr. Daniel Black explains why Juneteenth is an important day to remember in America. Eleven Alive's Chesley McNeil. Crash my man. Starting his forecast. Morning. Hey. Before you get up. Helping you start the day prepared. Accurate. Worthy of your trust. Part of the 11 Alive Storm Trackers. Making sure you and your family are safe when conditions become severe. Five minutes out, Chesley. Chesley, you're next. Three, two, one. Well, here's your forecast for today, folks. We're looking at some heavy rain. Weekdays on 11 Alive Morning News. Juneteenth as a federal holiday is still a hot button issue here in America. Even though the holiday was signed into law a year ago, many still believe it should not be celebrated. But Dr. Daniel Black tells us why the day enslaved Americans learned of their freedom is so important to the fabric of our history. It must be a holiday for everyone to celebrate. It must be a holiday for everyone to celebrate. It's really more for white people than black people. Why? Because slavery was white people's doing. That's their, be the notion that slavery ended, white people should be celebrating that their good senses returned. That's really what this is about. Like they finally saw the light. Cause how dare you have churches? How dare you talk about Christianity? How dare you talk about God? How dare you talk about the salvific nature of Christ and hold human beings in bondage? There was something about Christ you didn't know. So for me, Emancipation Day is the day America meets Jesus. Because the day you understand my people ought to be free, now there's the possibility that you might know Christ. And so for me, I celebrate this, not because as if it was an achievement of my people, it was not an achievement of my people. Certainly my people did not want to be uh, enslaved, absolutely. And certainly they wanted to be free. But if there's an achievement, the achievement is for an America that did not have the good sense to know and to understand that all human beings ought to be free. So this day, white folks, Asian people, everybody in America 
for the first time all to get together and and this is supposed to be a hey, forgive me i'm sorry and we say which we've always said right no problem right that really really that is emancipation day because see emancipation wasn't just setting black people free it was setting white people free of a bondage too their bondage of holding someone else in bondage. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Voices for Equality. I'm Joe Ripley. Learn more about these stories and much more on 11alive.com voices.